Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the What the Finance podcast, where we talk to experts to help gain a greater understanding about what is happening in the world of finance and investing. Uh, we actually have a giveaway happening at the moment as well for the channel, uh, just to say thank you for the support and you know new supporters as well. Uh, so all you have to do is be subscribed to the channel on YouTube and comment below which company you believe will have a greater value by the end of the month. So there's actually five options. There's Spotify, ExxonMobil, Nike, Amazon, and Alibaba. So there's a bit of a mix. Uh, and It'll be the winner will be randomly chosen and you'll actually win the value of the stock at by the end of the month. So I know you're a bit of a Spotify fan, Antonio. So is that the company you'd be choosing or? I am. I'm, uh, that'd be the one for sure. That'd be the one. Yeah, we can talk a bit more about that. But yeah, uh, as you can see uh, on the podcast today, I'm happy to be hosting Antonio Linares, a private investor. And I think you've had a return of over 2000% uh, over the past few years. Is, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Well, wow, that's pretty, it's pretty crazy. So thanks for joining the podcast. And I guess how are you holding up and because we're seeing quite a lot of volatility. So has that affected maybe your returns or your investment outlook? Or Yeah, well, I started my career with two investments, which were AMD and Solar City, which later got acquired by Tesla. So I was I was feeling buoyant uh, just six months ago, right? And then uh, since I think the, the story has turned a little bit, a little bit south. But you know, looking at the fundamentals of these companies and stuff, I'm 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 confident they will do fine. I'm still holding them. This is something that happens often in the markets. I mean, people get very enthused at times, and then they get very depressed. Uh, you know, the miss the market analogy by Benjamin Graham, and it's a time when I think you actually make most of your money because once you pick a stock correctly, you make money if you're able to manage your emotions during the downturns. It's, it's of no help if you can pick the right stock but then get scared away when the price goes down. So, you know, it's, it's, it's somewhat frustrating, this experience, and it's prolonged in time. And it definitely feels like it for us millennials and, and Gen Cs and, you know, just younger people in general. But, but it's a time when I think you, you get to sharpen your tools. You definitely lose complacency, right? You're, not, you're never going to buy a stock again without looking at the fundamentals deeply and making sure you really understand what you buy. So it's just, it's just a time where you get better. If you manage to hold on and uh so yeah but i mean uh i think fun times ahead for sure yeah definitely we've seen that with a lot of the growth stocks that are down you know 70 80 90 percent some of them so it's really shown people hang on not everything always goes up <laughs> there is it's really important to actually look at the fundamentals of the company the industry you know does it have a moat i think that's a massive thing that we've seen as well that there's some really innovative innovative companies but they just don't have a moat like a zoom or you know there's um buy now, pay, pay later. They're, they're pretty interesting, but these big tech companies can just come in and basically replicate what they're doing and <laughs> steal their business. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, the the scenario for business is getting more blurry as we move into the 21st century because business is increasingly about laying down an infrastructure where in a given scope for business, electron management becomes a competitive advantage. And then all sorts of strange things happen there. So as an example, when Amazon started out and they started doing books, it seemed very sort of harmless and just like a whatever business. But then what they were doing is laying down this infrastructure where to dominate the book industry, the first thing you had to do was lay down an infrastructure where electron management just sort of put everyone else out of business, right? And, and so that blurs the boundaries between industries, what is a moat, what is not. Uh, how how fast do um, things compound? It's just a sort of less intuitive environment, and and it's no doubt given way to the to the excess valuations we had in the past five years. I think people were mistaken mistaking um, you know potentially spectacular value compounding processes with with just mirages, right? So uh, so it's difficult. Business is not really what it used to be uh, twenty years ago, and we just we have. Not, not, not necessarily new rules. You know, people a year or two ago were saying it's different this time, which is one of the, the main red flags in bubbles. Uh, it's, it's not like the art of investing has changed. You want to buy things that are going to have meaningfully more earning power in the future at a good price. But things that, um, how do you tell when something is going to have a much bigger earning power in five years or not? I think that the, the qualitatives there have changed. And, and, you know, an environment like today where everyone has a computer now and, and all these funds are crunching numbers and stuff, necessarily most, if not all alpha is qualitative. So you really have to dig deep into how business works. You need to play around with the technologies that are going to drive the GDP needle forward in the next 10 to 15 years. And, and if you don't, I think you miss out. You're going to miss out on all the insights that are going to produce spectacular returns. 
Yeah, it's interesting. So what do, what do you see as the things that are going to drive GDP in the next, I guess it's hard to go 2030, but maybe the next 10 years? Well, look, I mean, one, one buzzword that's been flying around the place for a long time is AI. And uh, when, when you say AI, most people imagine the sort of mythical creature that does things and that thinks for them and stuff. And it's actually just maths slash statistics on steroids. It's basically a Pearson correlation on steroids, right? But the thing is that a lot of the work in the tertiary economy, which is sort of the, the latest value added layer that we added to the economy, is about humans processing information and then communicating it to other humans which then translates down segments into the other segments of the economy um, as capital allocation decisions, right? If that makes any sense. Um, so then, you know, a lot of that can be done by AI in narrow domains. So maybe AI can't really pick the best asymmetric bets for the next 10 years, but then maybe it can figure out what to reply to someone in an office environment when X, Y, and Z happens. So that's a trend that's it's happening across the economy now slowly. I mean, um, you know, I started playing around with AI in 2019. And just three years before that, the technology was starting to, uh, to perform better than humans in some very narrow tasks. So this is a very nascent technology, very buzzy and so forth. But what's happening is all these Web2 platforms that are, that are they're dominating, they, they seem to be dominating the world now. What they have is this data harvesting infrastructure, which is, I think it's going to be quite indisplaceable in many, in many contexts. Uh, not all the platforms are going to be indispensable, but I think a number of them are going to be. And what they're doing is they're bootloading AI for whatever area of the economy they've laid down the electron management infrastructure for. So if, if you look at something like Google, which, which, by the way, I think data privacy is going to be an issue in the next 10 years. But if you look at something like Google, they have all these associations between data objects. Uh, I think it was something, I, I don't want to say the number because I'm not sure, but basically they, they just have this... Um, ontological structure of the world's data, right? And, and that's just bound to, to bootload probably one of the world's top AIs. If you look at Tesla, it's the same. Tesla looks like it's very much priced in and it looks like it's, you know, you're late to the success story, so to, so to speak. But actually what they're doing is deploying an infrastructure that's picking up data regarding transport. And that's something that's going to be immensely valuable because again, going back to the tertiary economy and maybe th this is more of a secondary economy thing, drivers so transportation all they do is process visual stimuli and then act accordingly and take decisions to steer left steer right accelerate and brake right so that all is going to be sort of eaten away by this technology and what it's going to do is it's simply going to push humans further out into the creative newosphere so to speak so you know maybe 2000 years ago we were gravely concerned with um with crops and that was sort of the most uh, valuable layer of the economy and we've we've been getting pushed out by our own technology further and further into the more creative aspects so i think that a lot of these assets that that seem totally priced in today google tesla stuff like that i think in the next 10 years they're going to behave asymmetrically i mean i don't think these companies are going anywhere but up and and this is happening across other platforms that are less less obvious in this context like spotify you know which which we'll discuss in a bit but i think ai is going to be one of these trends and then the other one is going to be synthetic biology, because um, it, it looks like we've achieved sort of the pinnacle of, of technological achievement in the past 10 years, but actually we are biological entities. And so is the world that surrounds us. So actually we have little agency over this world. And it's all sort of, it, it happens at the molecular level and it's highly complex. And, and just navigating that space requires orders of magnitude, more computation, computational power than we have today, right? So synthetic biology is just about making stuff through biology. And as we figure out how to make stuff through biology, we learn enough to be able to program it, edit it, like we do with computers. And I think that's just brewing um, the next technological wave that's gonna wow the world. It's gonna definitely drive the GDP needle forward. And there's some very asymmetric investments in that sense that I've, I've done uh, in the past year that I'm very excited to talk about. Yeah, definitely. And you keep mentioning electron management. Sorry, how would you define that? So look, I mean, the thing that humans have been doing forever, and we're going to continue doing for, uh, forever, uh, for however long we stay around is basically unlock new ways to configure atoms. So I think someone quoted um, Jim McKelvey, if I'm not mistaken, the other day saying ideas compete for atoms. So everything around us, including ourselves, we're just atoms put together in different ways. 
And if, if you sort of go back through human history, the way we've progressed out into the creative space and, and sort of towards material abundance and stuff is by figuring out new ways to put atoms together that yield some sort of beneficial configuration. And actually, the, the, the example that's defining our lifetimes is semiconductors, right? So semiconductors are just a way of arranging materials that conduct electricity in a certain way so that we can compute, right? And, and that's just about putting atoms together in a way that electrons flow in a specific manner when you pass a charge through them. That's all it is, right? So again, th that seemed like something very um, minor when it first came up. Actually, if you read Andy Grove's books and, and you see um, the, how he talks about people's initial thoughts when semiconductors could only do two plus two and stuff like that, it seemed very minor, but actually what it was doing, that technology is sort of turning the information game, sort of unlocking new atom configurations into an information game in itself. So it's now no longer humans figuring out these configurations, it's computers, right? So that's what I mean. When you, when you lay down an, uh, an infrastructure for uh, electron management, say books, Amazon, you're basically building a platform to connect supply with demand, which is what the whole industry was doing previously analogically with humans talking and writing things on paper and sending them through, I mean, you have to sell, you have to send physical books through analog devices. But what I'm saying is all of that was happening through analog uh, devices, humans, right? Once you lay down that uh, platform infrastructure, it's all about the electrons flowing back and forth, connecting supply and demand. And then once you apply computation to that, then you can begin to predict as Amazon has done, who's gonna buy what book in the future? How should we stock up? How should our suppliers stock up? How should we optimize the logistics network? And then all of a sudden you have something that just eats away the rest of commerce, right? Because they tap into that fundamental process of how do we configure atoms to better um, serve our customers, right? And so going back to synthetic biology, just to give you an example of that, the human body is, is sort of this very complex collection of proteins doing stuff, right? And the function of a protein is determined by its shape because proteins come together based on electromagnetic attraction, right? So if you have this shape, it's gonna bound in with another shape that's like that, just because they have this natural electromagnetic attraction. So when I say we make things through biology and we're gonna figure out how to have way more agency over the biological world that we're in, um, it's all about processing information. So what specific protein shape do we need to, to create in order to solve this problem? And you may have seen in the past week how this new drug that I think was tested in, uh, in 18 patients cured them all of colo colorectal cancer, right? And, and that's basically a monoclonal antibody. So it's a protein of a specific shape that I believe in this case, I may be wrong because I haven't dived into the details, but it signals the immune system to, hey, here's a, here's a tumor, attack this. That is all information. We just figured out a shape that's the correct shape to trigger the immune system to attack um, a tumor at a specific location. So it's, it's all about electron management going forward. Can you process the information to figure out new uh, beneficial arrangements of atoms to just solve problems in the economy for people? Yeah. And if you look at the demographics and how things are changing, especially in you know China, the Western world, it's going to be vital for an aging population where there's lots of people, as you said, who are, you know, who might need that because as we know, the older you get, the more likely you are to have these illnesses. Yeah, I mean, that's another issue that I'm looking into, which is, and, and it's, it's, it's sort of parallel to these technological advancements, but not really, because people, I think I'm missing the point here, although not everyone in the, in, the, in the medicine industry, but a lot of the medicine that we have today, and in fact, generally Western medicine is about suppressing symptoms. And increasingly less so as we dive into the human protein when we figure things out, right? As, as this example with the uh, cancer drug that I was talking about. But generally, if you look at the way we're treating chronic illness, um, it's, it's very at the symptomatic level when actually, if you read papers that are coming out in the last couple of years, it's obvious that a lot of this dysfunction this stems from um, intestinal dysbiosis, so, right? So a human is basically a super organism, right? We have all this bacteria inside us and, and we have a symbiotic relationship with this bacteria, uh, which lies in our gut mostly. And when this gut, when this bacteria becomes out of balance and we end up having more bad bacteria than good bacteria, then things happen in the body which produce or, or seem to produce this chronic dysfunction. Namely, what happens is you get a leaky gut, right? And once you get a leaky gut, 
and you put food into the gut as, as humans do usually, right, day to day, a lot of this food makes its way into the bloodstream in the form of a protein. So in normal healthy digestion, what happens is you put food, which is just basically, you know, molecules and stuff, and it gets broken down into at least amino acids, which then the body uses to build proteins again. When you have a leaky gut, the proteins go straight into the bloodstream. So then a lot of these proteins are recognized as foreign by the, uh, by the body. And then what happens is the body produces antibodies to attack these foreign proteins, right? So then that, that sort of initiates a whole chain of dysfunction, which actually I find, and, and you know, some, some doctors that may be hearing this saying, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about this, but I'm pretty sure reading the papers that I've been reading over the past two years, this, this explains a lot of the chronic mystery illnesses, including the autoimmune conditions that we see in the world. And they're actually, as you say, taking on a larger share. And so, you know, we have AI, we have synthetic biology, but on the other end, we have to take care of humans accordingly. And we have to give people proper food and we have to give people the education to take care of their health properly, which right now we don't. And that's why chronic health issues are on the rise. Yeah. And we've seen, you know, I'm, I've been looked into carnivore, which is where you just see meat, and there's evidence that that may benefit people with chronic illnesses, but it's hard to know, is that because you're just eating meat or is it because you're reducing a lot of the other bad stuff in your system? So maybe grains and other things that might not be natural, but so I guess there's all these different things to look at, which is, I guess, the struggle that this, it's such a complex system. It's really hard to find out what's actually fixing the issue. It is, but you know, I mean, the, the main, one of the top markers in human health is inflammation. If inflammation goes up, then problems are soon to abound. Traditionally, we thought that inflammation was a result of illness. And now we understand that it's mostly a precursor. So actually, if, if you just do a diet that's anti-inflammatory, you're bound to do better than otherwise. And so th there's some very simple tips for that. But basically, there's a number of vegetables that do produce inflammation. They're called the, the nightshade vegetable family. And then alcohol, sugar, uh, refined carbs, processed food in general. If you just remove that, inflammation goes down dramatically and your energy levels go up. Eventually, the gut fixes itself and, and health gets restored. And, and there's a lot of innovative medical practitioners that are writing about this and it actually works but we have this food system which is you know it has naturally its incentives and we just have created this system which on the one end is feeding increasingly more and more humans which is a great success but the quality of the food is going down and um you know i think 55 percent of the market of the seed market in the world is controlled by three companies and it's dupont uh monsanto and another one and, and they, I, I believe they engineer the seeds genetically to produce some beside properties and stuff. So, you know, we, we actually have to redo the food system in order to feed people in a nutritional manner in the coming decades. And that's a huge opportunity too that I'm looking at. Yeah, I remember reading, that I think Bayer, the German company, they had some um, specific seeds that they weren't going to give to Russia because of the war. And then, as you said, they have, it's crazy, you don't think about it, but they have a massive impact on food supply around the world. And um yeah, I think, I think that's really interesting. And I know a company that you, you wanted to actually come on and talk about was uh, Emiris, uh, so A-M-R-S, which is sort of what you're talking about. I think they focus on this synthetic biology. So I'm not sure if you can tell us a bit more about them and, and what they do. Of course. Cool. So Emiris is a very interesting company and they are leading the synthetic biology space, which is, again, is about making stuff through biology. So what's happening in the space is a lot of these companies have uh, gotten hyped up in the past couple of years. Of course, the price has come down but really the only company that's capable of actually producing stuff at scale through biology today is Amherst. And then in turn, it's incredibly undervalued. And so if you dive deeper into the company and you look at their parts, you realize that it's, it's selling it. It's, it's an incredible arbitrage situation today because firstly, the company is very good at producing uh, molecules through synthetic biology at scale. And that's way harder than it sounds because in traditional production methods that are bound now on the planet, uh, the production methods are not alive. So we use machines that are made out of steel and whatever, and the steel is not alive. But when you make things through biology, what you're basically doing is putting genetic code into a prokaryotic cell, which is uh, like a simple cell, like a yeast cell. You're putting this code into it, and that's basically acting as an instruction to go and then produce something. So a specific genetic code is going to translate into a given um, molecule uh, in terms of the, the cell's output. And so... Doing that at scale is very hard because if just one single cell in a 
in a scaled up culture goes wrong, then the whole solution, the, the whole um, the whole production device can go rogue and it can be a waste of money. So actually it's very hard to do. And these guys just excel at that when the rest of the industry is struggling to produce one single molecule at scale. Thus far, Amris has uh, successfully synthesized 30 molecules that it then commercializes either by sending it to other companies or by um, via its own proprietary brands. And the cool thing about these molecules, the way, the reason for which I think the business is promising is that biology is able to make these molecules that consumers find useful in end products, A, in a much more sustainable way, B, in a cheaper uh, manner, right? So it's competitive in two fronts. It's cheaper and then it's more sustainable. And then if you sort of analyze the rising trends around, uh, across the consumer scape, what you have is people increasingly prefer sustainable products, but they're not really willing to pay more for sustainable products at the end of the day. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, they're concerned about their economy and that's just slightly ahead of the environment. And I think it's always going to be. And uh, that's the nature of human beings. And so these guys are hitting the two buttons. And at the moment, the company is growing its top line very fast. Uh, I'll, I'll put out some uh, specific numbers now in a bit. Uh, but essentially, the problem the company has now is bringing costs under, under control. And that's because getting all this infrastructure together in a cost-effective way is hard, right? But they have achieved something that, you know, just five years ago was considered impossible, which is making stuff at scale through biology. I mean, this company has a track record of consistently missing quarterly estimates because what they're doing is right at the edge of science. So you can't really match being at the edge of science and pushing that frontier forward together with the Wall Street sort of quarterly um, entertainment, right? And, and that's sort of what's been bringing the stock down in the past 10 years. And now it's just sitting at a valuation, which is ridiculous. Yeah, and I think um, one, one thing, I, I talked to someone, uh, Scott Nations recently, and he was saying that, I think it was in his quote, you, you might support what a company's doing, you might want them to succeed, but it doesn't mean you should actually invest in that company. So I guess how do you how do you explain that to people? Because as you said, they have been missing targets at the moment. It's it's hard to know when they're actually because as you said, it's such a complex and they're at the forefront. So how do we know when they'll actually turn this around and maybe turn into something where they'll be extremely profitable and be able to take over the industry? Well, you don't. So if you do allocate, you have to allocate accordingly. I mean, I I have I have some very high conviction place in which I place a large percentage of my portfolio. This I have a very high conviction on, but it's very, very high risk. So then I assign a smaller percentage of my portfolio. And if it goes wrong, I lose 100% of that position. But if it goes right, it has a chance of, in my opinion, over the next 15 years, doing 1,000x. Because look, what they're getting right is making stuff through biology. And you actually see it in their top line, right? Their core revenue, which is basically uh, the revenue that comes from uh, the consumer proprietary brands and technology access, which is selling molecules to other companies, is up 13x from Q1 2019 to Q1 2022. So the, the top line revenue is, uh, growth is spectacular because they are giving the market what it wants. Right? But then this whole issue of costs, what they're doing now is vertically integrating uh, their company. Right? So they're, they're, they've built their own proprietary facilities. To, to synthesize these molecules, to then produce consumer products. And then apparently uh, two thirds of the costs of operating any, any one of these brands that they have, which by the way, are some of the, um, uh, the, growing, the fastest growing brands in the US, two thirds of these costs are packaging and shipping. So when they, when they bring together their operations, which you know, for the past 10 years, they haven't, been, they, they haven't had the chance to do so. They've been contracting external suppliers and so forth. It just could work. And, uh, and, but fundamentally, if you compare this and you deeply understand the technology, if you compare it with what happened to semiconductors 10 years ago, you know, again, it could all go wrong. But then at the same time, when you see this technology synthesizing molecules like uh, CBG uh, and other very useful molecules that have amazing properties, you realize that this technology is going to progress in the next decade or two to synthesize entire organisms. This is like when semiconductors were confined to doing two plus two. Um, and then now we have them doing these wonderful things that are going to drive GDP forward in spectacular ways. The same thing is going to happen with biology because the fundamental building blocks extend to, to these applications that I say, right? The, the same building block to synthesize a simple molecule today, which is figuring out what code to put into what cell under what conditions, applies to say in 15 years time, making a car through biology that then is able to replicate itself. 
And it sounds crazy, but if, if you look at this technology from first principles, it can very well happen. And then going back to the market, you see the way the market is processing this and it's wrong because the market is, is sort of enthused, still is, with other companies like, for instance, DNA, um, the ticker is DNA, the name is Ginkgo Bioworks. It's enthused with this company, which is trading at uh, many times the valuation of, um, of Amaris. And actually this company doesn't have a way to fulfill its promise. It's, it's promising the world to be an AWS for synthetic biology. But um, in, uh, if you look at Amaris in their latest um, molecule synthesizing plant, what they're doing is parallelizing computation almost. They're parallelizing the synthesis. And, and, and still, I think they have a limited number of bioreactors. I just can't pull out this data as I speak, but they, they have just a bunch of them, right? When previously they were running a couple of tanks and sort of cleaning them and then getting them to work again and stuff. In order to run an AWS for synthetic biology, you need to have so many tanks running in parallel and then repurpose them in a matter of, I don't know, a very short cycle. And the technology just isn't there. But then in turn, that company that promises that is valued at many times Amaris, which, which is actually, which it has real product traction in the market, if you know what I mean. So this, this whole um, synthetic biology environment has great uh, promise for the next decade or two, and the market is reading it wrong. So even if you get Amaris margin, even if I get, or whoever gets Amaris marginally right at this point, because of the valuation, the upside is meaningful, if you know what I mean. So it's very asymmetric. Uh, the margin of safety is there because if you look at the valuation today, so the valuation is $687.3 million, the market cap today, which is just, to me, it's outstanding. And then if you look at the consumer brands in Q1, 2022, they cashed in just $23 million. But for the whole year, uh, they cashed in way more than that. I mean, even if you just look at the numbers from 2020 for the consumer and ingredients business, they cashed in around uh, 112 million dollars and if you roughly 10x that you get like a billion and uh, anyway if you, if you go a little bit deeper into the bioscience brand uh, which is um, the fastest growing beauty brand in the US that brand alone is probably worth something like 500 600 million which means that roughly if you, if you take the company by parts uh, it's just sitting at an incredible discount today you effectively get its capacity to synthesize stuff at scale for free which is something that the entire industry needs um, to go forward. And it's true that in Q1, they had a very high cash burn. Uh, and, and that's concerning because, you know, the, the balance sheet isn't that strong. So that adds a lot to the risk. But anyways, uh, this, is a, this is an investment of a binary nature. And if they do indeed over the next year or two manage to vertically integrate the company properly and bring costs under control, then uh, it will be a success story. And otherwise, it'll probably just go to zero. In which case, I even believe that the parts will, will probably return uh, a little bit to investors at the moment. Yeah, but they, I'm sure they'll be able to sell their technology to other competitors. But I, I think a key thing that you said at the start was allocation. And, you know, for me, I, if you compare that to something like the Kelly criterion, which is a sort of used for gambling, saying that, especially when it's a risky bet, which, you know, you could say this company is, that you're going to allocate a much smaller percentage of your portfolio to that. But because you think it could go up exponentially, you're still going to make great returns. Is that sort of how you look at your allocation? Absolutely. I mean, I think if this company survives and if it does well in 15 years, it's not making molecules, it's making entire organisms and it'll be uh, probably worth a trillion plus. That's how I'm looking at it. We're talking about a long uh, investment horizon, so not, not in six months. We're talking about 10 to 15 years. And I just think that a, a minuscule investment now can make a, a, a meaningful difference in your portfolio down the line, for sure. And, and do you ever have things where, say, if you see some news and you don't like it, would you exit your position? Like what would be an example maybe of some news that you think changes your hypothesis and then you'd actually exit it completely? Yeah, well, what I do is I, I follow the fundamentals quarterly and then I continually uh, continuously educate myself on whatever space the company operates in uh, and the resulting intersections with other spaces and stuff. And if my view of the world changes or the company does something that I think is... is uh, reduces the, or, or eliminates the viability of the long thesis and I'll exit. But usually before I initiate a position, I look at it very carefully. So I'll be studying it for months, if not sometimes years whilst I build the position. And it all starts with, uh, I once read this book, which says that your bets are a direct expression of your beliefs, right? So you're not 
you're not you're never really going to make investments that are adjacent to your beliefs uh you're going to just naturally make bets that uh correspond to your view of the world so i spend a lot of time studying technologies studying history studying psychology stuff like that so that i get the most informed view of the world possible and then i just find these little pieces that i think the market is missing and i invest in that um but yeah i i follow the fundamentals quarterly and then when i deal i have like i have different uh levels of riskiness inside my portfolio for instance spotify or tesla is a whole different game to this um when i saw the cash burn for the last quarter in Amherst, which was high i sort of wasn't shocked uh because i expect the company at this stage to be doing stuff like that and you know as i was saying the market has a much of the confusion about Amherst comes from the ceo not playing the quarterly game correctly but he these guys are pushing science forward in a way that's just incredible right so you have to see this in a different light plus if you look at the history of this company it's in the best shape it's ever been in and it's been trading sideways for a long time without a viable business model and so forth and i really doubt that it's going to go bankrupt now if it hasn't in the past 10 years it's true that we're going into an environment with higher rates and so forth but all the people that are all the investors all the capitalists that are looking at this space um that understand the biology is the future see this as a not all but most see this as a very promising asset so i'm i'm just willing to play it down all the way to 0.1 if you know what i mean yeah exactly go all in do you know how much cash they have on hand i guess yeah. that might be the the concern because i think last year they were they almost had you know negative 400 million i think through their capital expenditures and investments so i guess that's a challenge if they you know do they have enough cash to continue this growth and to actually be able to achieve profitability or they're going to run out because i think i think that's a major concern for a lot of these companies it's they need so much cash to actually get to the point where they can innovate because it's such a cash intensive business yeah they have um 287 million now in the balance sheet and and by the way just to whoever's listening to, uh, to this i write all the details about my investment thesis in the substack so if, if you just want to accompany listening to the podcast with my write-ups and the companies that'd be best uh but what happens is in, in the last call, management said that they were confident that they would be able to pull in, if I'm not mistaken, 250 million from a deal to sell molecules to a company called DSM. And, you know, while that's uncertain and it's very risky because it might happen or not, I wouldn't be surprised if it does, because generally what, what's happening in the market is people want sustainable uh, products. And so the companies that are facing these consumers know that and want to gain an edge over their competitors. So if you just look around, who's producing molecules that are sustainably crafted uh, at a competitive price. The only one is Amaris. So this one is really offering the market something that they want. So I just, I just doubt that they're going to run out of cash. I think they're going to close the deal uh, along the year and that's going to give them cash to carry on in this very risky venture. But I think they're doing well. And, uh, and the plants, the, the new production plants will be coming online soon. And I, I think we're going to see that making a meaningful difference uh, going into the second half of the year and sort of along 2023, 2024, if all goes well, I think we'll see the company click its, uh, its unit economics. But again, and I'm obliged to say this, this is a very, very high risk pick. But again, when I looked at AMD back in 2014 and I saw the technology they were brewing, it was very similar. Just saw a company with great technology that was trading at a, at a ridiculous valuation, right? Almost like bankrupt. And I figured, well, I can lose all of my money or I can make a, an amazing return on this. Uh, and, and, you know, one thing that I overlooked there was the management. I didn't know Lisa Sue was going to be so good, but I did recognize a company that had great technology. And then secondly, and perhaps most importantly, that the world in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years was going to need more and more computation, right? So here's the same thing. We're going to need biology because we are biological beings. We need agency over this technology. So the human condition is going to go from being a condition to a technology in the next couple of decades. And this sort of technology is just going to power that. Yeah, it's interesting. And you mentioned before sort of how you look at things and you spend almost, you know, sometimes years actually analyzing companies and industries and gaining a great understanding. So do you start from just thinking about the world, thinking about industries of the future, and then from there, learning about them and going to the companies? Or do you maybe find a company and then... Yeah, you know, so bottom up rather than top down, I guess. What, what's your way of doing it? 
I have a very random process where I just wake up and I study whatever I, I feel curious about. Uh, so, uh, for instance, in, in the last couple of weeks, I've been doing healthcare. But then uh, over the last year, I've been doing a lot of synthetic biology, uh, a lot of psychology, a lot of uh, stuff related to computing and stuff. So I just follow my interests naturally. And I, I sort of trust that instinct. And then eventually, when I combine all of that uh, sort of contemporaneous knowledge, so knowledge about the latest stuff that's happening with historical context, and I, and I sort of understand, I, I increase my understanding of what humanity is and where we're heading towards. I just, I sort of see this puzzle sort of clicks down the line and I'm looking 10 to 15 years down the line and I see this piece that I want to buy that the market is not seeing that I have um, a high certainty that it's gonna, the piece is gonna fit in the puzzle, right? And that's how I invest. And, and of course, what I was saying at the beginning of the podcast that the, the business landscape has changed because we have all these new technologies and just fundamentally the cost of information, uh, information transactions is going down, which changes the way we organize ourselves around value and how we produce it, how we transmit it and stuff. That does not leave behind the principles of value investing. Benjamin Graham stuff. You know this phrase that says all 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 that all intelligent all intelligent investing is value investing. That doesn't mean you should go and buy um, you know train companies and coal companies and so forth in 2022. It means you should be looking out to what's what lies ahead. Where is humanity heading? Where are the differential value added layers of the economy going to come from next? But not forget these principles because you can get that right and still buy something at a ridiculous valuation and get hurt, right? So the name of the game is figure out where humanity is heading, understand the world better and better every day, read wide and deep, understand technologies, understand psychology and so forth, and then just lay on top of that some, some value investing principles. So to me, just to answer your question, what I look for is the intersection of value and growth, uh, you know, and try and, and fit the pieces in the puzzle of where humanity is headed at. Yeah, it's fascinating because as you said, you don't want to go too far one way or too far the other because as we're saying, they're always transitioning. So if you can actually find it in the middle and that's the key mechanism. Yeah, and, and, and the market is going to be missing the point many times uh, and you see it now. I, see, I have some, I mean, I can be very wrong, but I have some very high conviction plays that I've allocated a large percentage of my portfolio to and the market is just blatantly missing the point because... The, the one thing that keeps the market away from, from this sort of alpha that I speak uh, about is short-term thinking. Uh, the market and most investors think short-term, so then they're just not able to, to capture on these opportunities because it's just it's not how the average human brain works, right? And so you see you have all these opportunities sitting in the market today in plain sight that are just free ATM machines, so to speak, you know? Yeah, I remember I had a job interview at a charity and that in their investment um, um, and they was, I was talking long-term five, 10 years. And the reason I didn't get the job because that wasn't long enough. <laughs> they were thinking more 20, 30, 50, you know, 100 years. They're like, it, it, we want to set up this, it's the largest charity in the UK. And they're like, we want to set up this charity to the point where we can fund all this research for the next 100 years. But I wasn't thinking like that as you said a lot of us think five ten years is a long way but it's not there's so much you know you, you have to think about it in further into the future well, look i was flying around this book called the warren buffett Portf portfolio last week just to give myself a little bit of courage around the bear market <laughs> and there's this study that the book uh, the book quotes which is the correlation between um advances in earnings per share or earning power however measured and the actual stock price and if you, if you measure that from an interval of zero to one years, I think it's, uh, or zero to two years, it's 0 0.3. So it's the, the correlation is pretty much inexistent. Three to five, it's something like 0 0.5. So it's like playing the roulette. And then beyond that, uh, the correlation becomes somewhat more direct. And I think uh, in a duration of 10 years, it becomes 0 0.68 for the number. And it'll vary according to the study. But basically what it means is that in the short term, the stock market is a voting machine. And in the long term, it's a weighing machine. And I just can't figure out how, how people play these things, um, you know, with two years, one year, three years investment horizons. It just doesn't work like that. I guess if you think about what, what the market's built up of, mostly institution, a lot of it's institutional investment. And for them, 
you know, I worked at a hedge fund as well as an intern and they were releasing monthly returns, <laughs> you know? So for them, it's all about showing that monthly or the quarterly returns to try and get more money coming in, which is a issue for actual returns in the long term. Yeah, it is. And uh, it's, it's a lot to do with the expectations of their customers and just the, their portfolio turnover across um, even mutual funds is very high. I think it's something like 80% yearly or something. And, and they have all these things that internally are, are very accepted but I think are the chief enemy to, to, to wealth generation in the long term. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so I think, you know, I think there's a lot of rebuilding to do in the market and uh, there's a lot of retail investors that sort of inherit that, uh, that culture and, and it hurts them and, and people lose money and that's just not the way to go about investing. And it's a very stressful life. It sucks. You know, uh, looking at the tickets every day and uh, selling puts and buying calls and stuff like that. When, you know, it, it's a, it's a much more, uh, winnable game to just focus on fundamentals and, and and invest in companies that you think and just based on your own common sense without going crazy having to study all sorts of things and stuff that are going to have a much higher earning power in the future and that's actually you know peter lynch was an advocate of that and it's actually not that hard a game uh, and actually the more you sink into it the more you ignore the market and, and you know we'll see how my investments play out in the next five to ten years but i'm very confident about them to be honest yeah. And I guess you look at Jim Cramer and even FinTwit in general, it's all about daily content and trying to look at, as you mentioned, looking at the charts every day, which is not the way to do it. It basically drives you crazy <laughs> with, with the losses and all it influences you to make the wrong decisions most of the time. Yeah. I don't know how someone can make daily uh, buy and sell recommendations. Yeah. It's just, you know, fundamentals don't change that much. Uh, the market doesn't even fluctuate that much. Uh, but again, I, I don't want to be uh, condescending here or anything. It's just my game. It's how I play it. And, uh, you know, I remain open to, to figuring out other ways to play it for sure. Yeah. Are you concerned that, so say the last 15 years has been very good for growth stocks, maybe in the future, we might see a commodity super cycle, you know, many of these trends, deglobalization, onshoring, a lot of this stuff might actually, you know, it could still benefit some of the uh, mechanisms you mentioned, like AI, supply chains, whatnot, but could it be a going more into the value direction over the next 10 years, or does that not really affect your investment thesis? Yeah, sure. But I mean, I, I try to operate um, sort of perpendicular to the whole value growth macro thesis. I think that these things do help in general to drive uh, um, stock prices and it helps companies that, are, that don't have solid financials that he calls zero finance themselves. But basically, if you have a company that today has a, a series of underlying mechanisms and fundamental building blocks, that in the next five years, it's going to translate into exponentially more earning power. That is an investment for me, regardless of higher or lower rates. And uh, a lot of the companies that are sitting out there that I talk about that are opportunities in plain sight have that fundamental property. I mean, you know, for instance, AMD, I'm still along the company, even if rates go up a lot, even if they go down a lot, whatever, uh, recessions, non-recessions, booms, we're going to need more computing. They're going to continue to, so long as the culture they have persists, they're going to continue to provide the world with some of the best computing products, period. And that's going to translate into a better earning power as they buy back shares. That's going to accrue to relatively less shares. And it's going to be a successful investment. And, you know, AMD is, is kind of a, a victory lap for me now, as is Tesla, which I got really lucky. I got lucky in both, but specifically in the Tesla investment. When I bought Solar City, Tesla bought it at a half of the price at which I bought it at. And now it's up many times full. So I was very lucky. But about these new investments that I made this year, another one is Spotify that I have a very high conviction on that the market does not understand. Um, you know, the earning power is going to be much higher in five years. And the other day, actually, when Daniel Ek came up with his 100 billion revenue prediction, most people were like, what is going on? This guy is just delusional. I do not understand where 100 billion in revenue come from. But if you understand the idea of electron management and getting very good at it, expanding the scope, uh, and compounding the value like that, it just makes sense. All they have to do is continue to operate in the way they've been doing so, which is, you know, it's a highly contrarian statement, but I'm very confident about it. And right now the company is sitting at 1.8 times uh, sales, which is now a metric that's, that we're prohibited to use. Uh, just a year ago, everyone was using that saying, you know, 50 times price of sales is, is 50 times sales is fine. This is going to be an amazing company. And now people have sort of turned against that metric, much like, um, you know, during the 30s, they turned against the PE metric, 
low piece didn't mean anything to anyone. So people that bought these companies at reasonable prices did very well. That situation is, is, is producing now again, and regardless of the macro environment. Yeah, well, I know. I think um, how I discovered you was actually through Amit, and he's very he he doesn't like Spotify, and he's obviously has his own startup looking at called Odea, which is trying to help people get discovered because he I don't think he believes in the algorithm on Spotify. So I, I know you have a debate. I, I'll put that below, <laughs> and uh, I found it really enjoyable. But I guess can you just give, give us a short reason why you think it's going to take advantage of the data it already has? So look, Spotify is the world's largest audio network right and it's it's been beating its competition apple amazon and others because it has a 100 focus on audio which translates into a better product which in the digital space translates into exponentially better results so if you look at their growth of their monthly active users relative to apple music which i, I believe still um has not resumed disclosing the number and amazon and so forth it's exponential with respect to the rest because the cost for you as a user to switch between one and the other is relatively low, right? All you have to do is click here instead of there. And so exponentially more people flock to the marginally better solution. And then they just, they just compound value inside the platform in a way that makes it very sticky and it makes it almost indispensable for people. People increasingly find uh, Spotify something very valuable to their lives that they can't live without. Now, what's happening, going back to the whole electro management thing and stuff, when Amazon did the infrastructure for books and they got that to work the cost of them expanding to other scopes was marginal right so then they started selling other categories and then piling on other categories and continuing down that line until they've basically eaten up e-commerce right they're on the way to doing that now they still have a long runway ahead but now they're sort of this monstrous e-commerce solution that's unstoppable uh, no one in their right mind would do a, a bare thesis now, right? Although one day it will become a contrarian bare thesis, but it's probably not yet. So if you look at Spotify, they have all these users. The platform is growing very fast. The music business sucks because the labels take 75% of the money that Spotify makes. But then as they pile on new audio verticals with different cost structures, then the business changes fundamentally. And over the past couple of years, they've been adding podcasts just four years ago, they basically had no podcasts in the platform. And today they have 4.4 million. So it's it's become a kind of default go-to method to share podcasts with people. Whenever someone records a podcast, one of the things that comes to mind is posting it on Spotify, right? So what happens is this has a fundamental, fundamentally different cost structure, podcast with respect to music. And what's happening is that the information flying across the network is no longer just music, but people talking about all sorts of things and people listening to that. So you have, on the one hand, the creator economy. This platform is, is becoming a creator economy platform, which is gonna be indispensable in the future. And then it's brewing the world's um, largest audio ad network in the world, right? Because people are talking about all these things. So basically both the creator economy and the advertising platform are gonna add billions to Spotify's top line at a marginal cost. And that's all gonna flow down in the form of uh, impressive, spectacular, net income and free cash flow. And then as they continue adding further verticals, such as audio books that they um, announced in the last Investor Day, which I cover in my Substack, by the way, as well. And they continue piling in the further three verticals that they've disclosed, they're going to add over the next 10 years, which I believe, uh, although they haven't said this, are going to be new sports and education, e-learning. This is going to turn into a company that's just, it's going to cash in uh, 100 billion or more uh, um, by 2030. And by the way, Daniel Ek is not really much of an overpromiser. In fact, one of the issues that I've had and, and it's happened in, in most of the companies that I'm invested in is that the, the CEOs are very meek about communicating the opportunity that, that I see ahead and that I know they see ahead. But this company is it's just going to become a free cash flow machine by firstly establishing this platform that everyone just sees at T equals zero as a fundamentally flawed business in the financial sense. And as they pile in uh, new audio verticals, it's just going to become a cash machine. And I think it's actually going to rival Google as an advertising network. So trading at the valuation it's trading at today, which is 1.8 times sales, it's a steal. And actually, I was building my position initially at uh, $250, uh, $300. And then when it went down to 97, I doubled it. So I'm, I'm really sticking my neck out here in the internet. All, all this content is going to be out there in five to 10 years, but I'm happy to be held accountable because I think this is going to be one of the decades top trends. And then 
uh, top trades. And then if you compare this with Amaris, it has nothing to do in terms of the risk profile. Amaris is something that could go bust any day and I've allocated accordingly. Spotify is something that has such a strong moat, which, which is, as I say, the result of them focusing 100% on audio. Some people watching this and some people you may speak to say, well, I use Apple Music, Spotify sucks. I use um, Amazon Music, whatever. But the, the experience of an individual node in a network doesn't reflect the collective experience. And then you have to look at that from a sort of dashboard point of view to see where are people flocking to, where, where are numbers really growing, and it's Spotify. They're going to continue growing. People love the service. It has pricing power. People are willing to pay much more for it uh, than they pay for now. And it's just the metrics are going to continue to get better and better and better. It's, you know, one thing I learned from studying Tesla is that the company is an optimization machine. I have a deep dive in that company too on Substack. And so the key takeaway is that this company has a very decentralized operational structure. And it doesn't tell employees what to do. They have a digital twin with something like a couple dozen apps that give employees the information of what's happening across the enterprise real time. And then employees go and figure out what to work on based on their skills and preferences, right? Companies like that are excellent information processing machines. Going back to the idea of figuring out new configurations to put atoms together, that's what a company is. It's an optimization machine. You have to minimize input to maximize amp output and to do that, you just have to process information to figure out what levers to pull, right? So when you look at something like Spotify, why is it that the focus of uh, the 100% focus they have on audio is paying exponentially with respect to the competition? It's because they themselves, much like Tesla, have that culture, have that decentralized operational structure with high employee um, autonomy and empowerment that translates into decisions, correct decisions, compounding one another down the line. And it's just spectacular. In, the, uh, in their investor day, Tony Jabara, which is the head of ML, explained how every single decision in the, in the, in the company comes down to lifetime value. Because you, know, you, can, you can produce some spectacular short-term results, but then sacrifice the long-term value of the platform. But if you use the, long -term, the um, lifetime value metric, then every single decision that you make that passes through that filter just continues to add value on the platform. And as more users come online, as they expand to other audio verticals, it just creates this monster, which, which you know, for that reason, when Egg came out the other day and said 100 billion by 2030, for me, it's just the continuation of what they're doing. It doesn't, it doesn't imply um, miraculous acrobatics. Yeah, it's interesting. So uh, I think it is, you know, I guess people compare it to other subscription services, maybe like Netflix, but I think it's quite different in terms of, you know, audio is very different and music. You don't want to ha just have certain songs. You want to have basically everything at your fingertip and other audios, which you said Spotify does. I guess the concern is, and I'm not sure if I heard you say this or someone else, they were saying that uh, someone from Spotify was saying, you know, we have all the data, data. we have what we, we know basically what everyone wants. We know everything about them, but we're really struggling to actually implement these ads. And I guess how, how, how are they going to be able to do that, especially if people are paying a subscription? I guess that's a challenge. Are they going to do what Netflix is doing and, you know, they're looking to buy Roku and doing like a, a service like that, which they already have, or how are they going to be able to make all this revenue from ads? Well, look, just in um, Q1, they, they ran 2000 tests. And if you look at the UX, uh, one day uh, a new feature will pop up and then another day will be gone. And then sometimes it will persist through time. So they're, they're just constantly iterating the platform, looking for ways to add value, as I say. So, when you talk about these challenges going forward, I don't necessarily um, deny them. Of course, I mean, the, the execution they have ahead is very hard. It's, it's, it requires world-class execution, but then the machine they have to run tests, try things, discard options that don't work, incorporate the additions that do work. That's the machine that I'm investing in. That's how I think they're gonna make it click. And to be honest, that's also what has made the company look so boring. Uh, since it's IPO, because they, they don't do spectacular jolts forward. What they're doing is incremental modifications every day that, again, to the, uh, to the external viewer, it looks really boring. The financials are terrible and stuff, but that's exactly, exactly the mechanism that gets you from where you are today to 100 billion in revenue down the line. And you know what? Maybe by, in five years' time or 10 years' time, consumer preferences are completely different to what they are now. Maybe people don't want to pay for subscriptions. Maybe it's all ads. Maybe people don't want ads and then they have to flourish all these new um, 
subscription offerings. But the point is, can they compound the value that the platform offers the end user through time? Can they incrementally solve problems for, for both users, for creators, and for labels? Why not? If that, if that is so, which is, which is the case, they have all these endless methods of potential additional monetization, which is the value of the platform. And then, as I was saying, the question is, can you invest in a management team and an employee workforce that is able to capture part of that value successfully in a shareholder friendly way? And I think that this is it. Yeah, definitely. And no matter what you think, it's basically around its IPO price, which if we look at the financials, I'm sure it's, it's done a lot better. If we look at the revenue, it's gone from 2.15 or about 3 billion to close to 12 billion. And yet it's still around its IPO price. So you can say it's been growing the revenues like crazy. You know, it's, it's making free cash flow, but people are, are concerned about the potential, which obviously you, you don't think is an issue. Well, you know, there's, there's no such thing as a certain thing in this world, in the future, but I think um, this is a very good bet. And what happens now, the reason for which I doubled the investment when it went down to 97 is that even if that thesis gets broken at some point in the future, the music business is going to be better in the future than it is now not because they're able to renegotiate deals with the labels that again take 75% of the money that Spotify makes in the music business. It's because this platform that they're building is able to also add value to the labels themselves. So they're able to tap into the marketing dollars, right? So I, even, even that part of the business, I think that the gross margin is going to tick up uh, in the next couple of years. And then at this valuation, it's just a very asymmetric play. I mean, users are going to keep growing. The margins are going to keep going up. As you say, it's free cash flow positive and management intent, intends to keep the company as such. So, you know, even if the whole Google of audio play doesn't play out, which I think it is, it's going to be a, uh, an audio search engine 15 years down the line. Uh, then, you know, you can't really lose much of this valuation. I agree. And I'm, I'm looking at the moment, I think next few months is when I might. Yeah, who knows what will happen, but I think I might actually go into the company. So Antonio, thank you so much for your time today. We've talked about so many topics. And I guess my, my last question is, what is one message that you'd like listeners to take away from our interview? Well, I guess think long term. I think that uh, the stock market has the potential to be something that, that uh, unifies people. And the more long term thinkers we have, the more aligned humanity is going gonna, is gonna to be and the better results we're going to produce collectively down the line. Yeah, and I think a key thing I've taken from this is just do your research, you know, not just about the specific company, about the industry, and, and you know, don't, don't worry about rushing into it. If you're looking 10, 15 years' time, it doesn't matter if you get in now or in a year's time, does it? Sure, I think if you, if you really want to build wealth, that's the way to go. Yeah, perfect. Awesome. So thanks again for joining the podcast. I know you mentioned your sub uh, stack. You're also very active on Twitter. Is there anywhere else people can find your work oh just twitter and the sub stack and you know the, the conversation has been sort of very uh how we've talked about the big trends we haven't really dived into the details so if you want to if you want to learn more about how i think about these investments and stuff just go to the sub stack and, and check out my deep dives sounds great antonio thanks again thank you anthony it's been a pleasure Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you're leaving with some great value about investing, trading, and finance. See you on the next show.